My mom wanted me to go to private school. My dad was like, no, he will be a regular person. He will deal with regular people. And I wasn't that intelligent anyway. So <laughs> um, it didn't really matter. Honest Gosh, people don't have language. Barriers. They do. They really? really do. I don't have a successful relationships. I don't have. Uh... Does it bother you? that you don't? Uh, no, <laughs> like it's weird, right? We glorify sales guys yeah. as a more important people. In our industry, we don't do enough for the installer. We don't we, do enough for yeah. labor. Would you agree? In my area, they don't pay taxes and stuff. They were use illegals. I can pay a gutter guy 18, 20 bucks an hour to go be a regular gutter guy and work normal hours and stuff. Or you could go stock shelves at Walmart for $23 an hour. Like, How am I supposed to compete with that? All right, today we're sitting in probably one of the cleanest, uh, cleanest warehouses, factories I've ever been to. This man have built well-oiled machine, uh, absolutely impressive operation, but he is not a roofer. He is not, uh, he does not have manufacturer background. So we're gonna start right there, Austin. I wanna know what did you do before this? List all the jobs, full-time jobs that you hold okay. before starting your business. Wow, okay. <laughs> First, uh, I was uh, at a go-kart place. I worked at a go-kart place and uh, got fired from that, from letting all the pretty girls ride for free. <laughs> um, so then after that, I, I worked in several restaurants, uh, eventually finding myself at one of those tapenaki restaurants where like the hibachi, yeah, yeah, yeah. where I had the hat and I cooked in front of people okay. and stuff. So you've done that? Yeah, yeah, dude, can you <laughs> imagine a six foot four you know, 18 year old working at a hibachi place. That's not the person you want to see that, when you go the, in there. The, uh, I've spent last 24 hours with this guy. This guy loves to cook. Is that where it's I love from? to cook. I love to cook. That was one of the first cool cooking jobs I've got. And then after that, I started with my father who owned a uh, manufacturing facility. Um, he built and sold folding sectional work platforms um barges for shoreline construction bridge work all that kind of stuff i eventually started there mowing grass and then i became a forklift driver and then i grinded welds i sandblasted so you that put you all the way in the, in the all ground. the way in the very bottom i cleaned bolts when i was like eight you know i was like doing whatever and uh and eventually led me into hydraulics welding purchasing accounting then sales and all that kind of stuff and through all that stuff i would take breaks go out and try to do my own thing. I did try to do college for a while, try to do a lot of jobs like uh, work in restaurants, serving, things like that on those on those breaks. But ended up being with my father at, at the end before this. How uh, big was your father's company at that time as you were growing up? Like lots of employees? Oh yeah, so like, uh, I mean, in the beginning, probably around 30. Uh, now um, he's halfway exited that business um, at 120. Wow. 120 um, in, in this area. But your dad did not, uh, let me ask you this. Yeah. Did you grow up rich or poor? And uh, <laughs> talk to me about the relationship with your sure. father about I that. grew up white, I think right privilege probably exists. <laughs> um, I know that should be like a bad thing you shouldn't talk about, but I, it's funny. Um, no, like I grew up with money. Um, I know people love to say like, oh, it's so hard. And I grew up poor and yeah. I, I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't grow up poor. <laughs> Um, my dad though was very good about making me work for everything. There was always, uh, there was always the other side of that. If I asked him for a hundred dollars, he would give me that hundred dollars. No problem. If I want to go to the movies or take a girl out or go with my friends, buy video games, whatever I was going to do, but there'd always be a connnotation to that. Be like, all right, you're going to wash and wax all the vehicles. You're going to, you're going to clean the stairs. You're going to do all that stuff. There wasn't just uh, yeah, no problem. Here you go. Do whatever you want. And I had to, I had to weigh those things. How much do I want to go to the movies? To how much I want to wax and wash all of the cars? And some of them are huge, like '59 Cadillacs, like huge cars. And I'm like, I don't think that's fun. I don't want to do that. But he was really good at it. But I, there's no shame in the game. Like I grew up very privileged. I got to do a lot of cool things, and a lot of that was work. You know, I got to go with him and learn how to weld and use a cutting torch, like the acetylene torches. Um, at when I was a teenager and I got to go then travel on business calls and go meet people. I was on private jets very early on going to Mexico to check on manufacturers and things like that. It was, yeah. People don't get exposed to that all the time. And I felt really lucky and like the term privileged and stuff came up probably seven years ago or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I was probably privileged. So would you say you learned your uh, business from your dad? I definitely took a lot of the things that, that he did well 
and the stuff that I was exposed to, it wasn't that unfamiliar to me. Like if you're going to start a fast food place, you better have worked in a fast food restaurant so then you can mirror some of the stuff. Um, for me, obviously he never did roofing. He never did windows. He never did siding. Uh, he never did, you know, soffit fascia gutters, anything like that. But the manufacturing and the, the installing the technicians and how the service stuff went, how he treated customers and how he got business, how he developed relationships over time with suppliers or customers. That's some of the stuff that I took uh, into account when I had this, even like as far as payroll. Like I know that when you started your stuff, part of being a business owner, even when you had a roofing company, payroll is such a huge part of that. Yeah. That's it's not talented. something they teach in school at all. Yeah. Like, and I don't know if you went to college or not, but like, that's a really different thing. Like we all know how to put a screw into a wall or a roof or something like that. But like how to find out FICA and state tax, uh, you know, uh, county tax and how to, how much to save for IRS bills or where to find the best accountants, what you should look out for and, and uh, what you should pay people salary, salary, hourly, 1099. Did you learn it from your dad? I learned all that stuff from my dad and it, and it became, uh, a little bit more familiar to me. And I think that's why I got off to a really decent start really fast. I was solvent in five weeks. Love it. I, would, I, I borrowed $25,000 from my dad to start the business. And uh, I gave him the title of my truck because obviously not something for nothing. He needed the title to my truck to give me 25,000 wow. bucks, but I was solvent in five weeks. I had paid him back. Um, everything was good. And we were even in five weeks, but mm. that's because I knew all that stuff from being working on all those different places and those different jobs. Very cool. Talk to me about your rugby career. Mm -hmm. uh, you traveled to Australia. Like what's up with the rugby and uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana? Like, Yeah, there's there's a rugby community here um, that's big. I played in high school. So you have rugby team at high school? Yeah, we had a rugby team in high How school. How many teams in the United States for rugby? Like, is it a hundreds, thing? It's hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. There's, a, there's an association, it's like, you know, it's one of those things. East Coast is big and lacrosse, obviously. Uh, is there a beef between American football teams and rugby teams? No, like, I think that there's a lot of jealousy between like the football players want to play rugby because it's really? more of like a carnal sport, less pads, more brutality, things like that, less rules. Why do you like it so much? I like it because they gave the big guy the ball. <laughs> you know, being I was always a big child, you know, I'm 300 pounds and six foot five now. And I wasn't too far off of being 200 pounds and six foot four in high school. Mm. But when you're that big, you only get to play O-line or D-line. So I'm pushing big players back and forth. There's no dynamic to that game. Yeah. Uh, in rugby, they would give me the ball in the middle of the field and tell me to go downfield and score. Like that was such a cool, everyone wants to be Tom Brady. Everyone wants to be, you know, a star at some point in the game. And that all 15 players on each side get to touch the ball. And I think that's a really cool part. And then again, with the no pads and stuff, there wasn't that I'm going to murder that dude, lower my shoulder and, and knock that dude out because you also didn't have any padding. You also didn't have that production and stuff. So you would tackle in such a more Pete Carroll for the Seahawks is really into rugby tackling where you wrap the legs and drive up and down. Um, and that took me to a lot of places like it, it. And it was fun. And I got to play for college teams and I got to go travel and go play. And that was a big part of my life. And honestly, if it wasn't for business and all that stuff, I'd still be playing rugby. Really? So you've been in Australia? Yeah, I've seen Australia. I've seen Canada. I've seen Mexico, British Virgin Islands. All um, with the rugby. All, all, with all the... rugby stuff, all stuff. Like, I mean, it was cool to go watch all those it's places. It's such a brutal sport. Places and... You know what? I, I love that uh, New Zealand. Is it New Zealand where they're like the, the dancing? Yeah, the haka before. It's... it's intimidating. It's like a ritual dance. And it, it's, it's more main. Who's the best in the world with the rugby? It, I mean, honestly, it was New Zealand for the longest time, but the, the Tongans and the Fijians, um, these islanders that are built like uh, New Zealanders and Hawaiians, like those big burly fat, those guys somehow found a way through proliferating throughout the years to get six foot seven people to be 225 pounds, run a 40 in sub, you know, four seconds. Like, like these guys are huge, fast, and they play on the beach. That's what their biggest thing they is for. The sand. They play in the sand. So on turf, they're unstoppable. <laughs> Trying to play a sport on the sand versus on, yeah, on yeah. turf is, is completely different. So if you watch sevens is a version of rugby, usually it's 15 on 15, but the Olympic sport is seven on seven. And it, they're going to be 
top five every every time, no, no matter what. It was New Zealand for the, the All Blacks were the the biggest rugby team for a long time, and now it's definitely uh, oh. the Fijians and Tongans and shit like that. One question I do want to ask for you as a big person: There's yeah. a lot of big people controversy now. I, I watch a lot of TikToks okay. where people. Uh, demand bigger seats in the airplane. I'm 200 pounds. If I go main cabin, it's You're, not comfortable yeah. there. And I do see how people, you know, tight. Like, if if you would go on a regular plane right now, like how uncomfortable you uh, are. Yeah, I'm I'm uncomfortable <laughs> with commercial travel uh, all the time. But you know, it was lucky that I was at a. You know, you deal with it. Sh should we give people two seats for one? I would rather, instead of making bigger seat belts and wider seats, I would like to see more leg room in the front. You're, you're a taller individual yeah, true. like myself. I'm, I'm six foot five, right? When I sit in a commercial seat, That's right. this doesn't hurt. <laughs> this doesn't hurt. My knees have scars on them from riding commercial jet. Like digging into the magazine holders and the armrest for the next person in front of me, that's what I would like to see changed. I don't really care. I'm not fat enough to where I'm spilling over in someone else's seat. Yeah, I might be sitting like this the whole time, you know, because I don't have any elbow room or something yeah. like that. But the, knees. but the knees thing, that's the worst part about my travel. I travel mostly first class now because I'm privileged, but, <laughs> you know, like I've been very lucky. Uh, but, yeah, that's the one thing I would change. I would change the the how far the next person is in front of you. Give me if, other pros and cons of being a bigger person, a 300 pounds. Uh, pros and cons. One, <laughs> um, if if you have friends, you're going to be asked to get be the moving guy all the time. <laughs> hey, man, can you come over and help me with my couch? I'm moving beds. I'm moving a dresser <laughs> or whatever. Like, you're just going to get called. And, and, like, that's when you're small, when you're five foot three, no one's calling you for that, <laughs> you know? uh when when you're big uh you get a lot of attention i go to other places i travel a lot and i'll be walking through the airport and like a random security guard or a police guy will just be like hey man do you play college football and i'm like nope like they'll just like you people get i it's hard for me to blend in to society and stuff like that you know they always want to know what sports i played or you know whatever uh the cons of it being that I drive pickup trucks almost exclusively because yeah, cars are uncomfortable, you know, getting down even like because, you know, you did a workout today with your back and stuff. My back hurts if I ride in a car, getting in and out of a car, getting down low and, and, and driving like that. It's uncomfortable. We talked about sports cars at one point. Like, that's never going to happen for me. I don't think they make sports cars um, for people that are six, five and over. Hmm. You know, Shaq has to have custom cars made for him really? so he can fit in them like he doesn't do that i'm not never thought about it yeah i'm not so the cons are that the world isn't built for you i don't know you probably don't have a problem with it but booths when I mean, you go to a restaurant you want a booth or a table don't look at me and go that dude is sitting at a at a yeah, booth, booth are i don't to want in. a booth i want a table <laughs> igor knows what i'm talking about like i want to sit at a table i want to be able to judge how far close i want to sit at the table i don't want to sit my gut on the table and things like that but that's pretty much like the biggest cons of like the world isn't always built for giants like myself it's funny you said uh, about like Shaq and stuff because most athletes like football players nba players they all need sports cars we need a sport car made for big people Come on, Elon, make an electric sports car <laughs> that fits giant people. That would be the thing, you All know? Right. What did you learn from rugby, playing rugby? Like, what lessons did you apply to your business life? And, like, usually when you play sports, like, you learn Got it. the discipline. There's, like, what about rugby as a sport? What did it teach you? The coolest part, I think, about rugby was the culture right i got a little bit of that that cultish we talked about crossfit at one point and stuff like that and how that's kind of cultish you know um that's not always a bad thing like there's buy into that um so the 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 things that the, the songs that you sing the camaraderie the hanging out after to always have a group of friends you can call on or or do all that kind of stuff was cool but i think what i learned from that is there's such a diverse group of people that play rugby right so on our team like, I know this is cliche to say, but we had doctors, lawyers, trash guys. Oh. We had P IT people. We had nerds. We had That's guys cool. that collected Pokemon cards. <laughs> we had race car drivers. We had uh, welders to um, people that would design buildings. <clears throat> like, there was all sorts of people. Um, and you really got to, like, have a group of people for the first time outside of school 
that was a, in a professional setting that you got to go expose yourself to without having to pay or be a part of like B and I groups or like shit like that. You got to like just hang out with those people and then they would introduce you to other people and bring you around and you get to meet a lot of cool people that way. How are you gonna meet a bunch of doctors and lawyers and carpenters and cool teachers and IT guys? How are you gonna get in that group? There's no group that exists for that. But in rugby, it's such a diverse group of people that played that. So, Love it. Um, do you consider yourself self-made or Ooh. that you inherited almost because you have a dad and you know he gave you a loan and stuff yeah, like, yeah, and yeah. he helped you with the success? Ooh, but great question. I hate you for asking. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, no, I do not consider myself self-made. All of my success is based on everyone around me. That's it. That's the whole thing. Friends, family, everything, uh, mentors, uh, they have all propped me up. Like, I don't take anything that I've did on my own. Um, no, I didn't get here doing it myself and I couldn't have. And it, it's not because of me we're successful at all. It's because the guy that I started stuff with, it's because of the, the first manager that I hired, it's because of the first you know, great sales guy that I had. It's the first blah, blah, blah. It's all these people and it just keeps on rolling and getting better. I and mean, maybe meeting you is like the next great thing that I think about is like, yeah, well, you know, he was cool at 10 million, but like when he made 20 million bucks a year, that, that's because he met this person, propped him up. There's always like another thing that I go, well, this is why this happened at this point. It's not because I worked harder or I was that much smarter or more diligent or that kind of stuff. It was just because I was good to those people and they're good to me. And that was pretty much the basis of my success. Is anyone self-made if you put it that way? Because nobody is self-made if you think about it. There's always oh, people. Man. You, who, who, you would say, and, and, and you, you, I make an argument just to be, yeah, sure, just to sure. be obtuse to you, sure. like app designers and things like that. People that have a good idea that go run with it and sell it for millions of dollars. I would seem to them self-made people. Um, people. But they also have people, mentors and opportunities around them who, Someone who opens the doors for you. And sure. There, you could always give it up to someone else. We give it up to God. We give it up to, you know, whoever, you know, but we just talked about earlier is like YouTube. Like you can learn anything you want on YouTube. Yeah. So like you can really be self-made. I, there's people online right now that are building furniture at their house because they saw a video of a guy building furniture on YouTube and, and they just want to do it and they copied and made it better and blah, blah, blah and now sold their patents or did whatever without any funding from other people, without all their friends helping them out and all that stuff. I think you could be self-made. I just don't take any credit at all, uh, you know, doing that kind of stuff. I like I, that attitude. Uh, yeah. One more question about your parents. Talk to me about your parents raising you, uh, the attitude, the like lessons, uh, how it transfers to your life, to your success later. Like you have a kid now. Yeah. Like, how did your parents truly raised you? What kind of rules, what can like they had for you, for you to become what you are today? And what are you gonna do to your kid to make sure he is not, you know, uh, he doesn't grow up entitled or, mm. you know, because you give credit to others, you're not entitled, you work hard, and it came from your parents. And mm. they say that, you know, businesses are ruined in the third generation. So now your dad was successful, you're successful. What are you going to do for your kid to be successful? Ooh, that's that's an interesting question. You know, I don't think it's dissimilar from a lot of people that, you know, that grew up in, in privileged families. Is like, you know, there's always some amount of different stuff. My, my parents did a really good job of making me go to public school, even though they had the money for private school. Mm -hmm. They made me go to public school because why? Because my dad said he will have to deal with the public. He won't deal with the private school people. He'll he'll deal with that. Wow. <laughs> you know, and, and that was a weird source of contention between my parents. They wanted me to go. My mom wanted me to go to private school. And my dad was like, no, he will be a regular person. He will deal with regular people. We're not doing that stuff. And I wasn't that intelligent anyway. So um, <laughs> it didn't really matter. But that was one of the things um, when they would talk about like when the school stuff they'd be like, well, there's drugs at public schools. There's all this other stuff. He's like, yeah, he needs to be exposed to that. We're not going to keep him in a bubble. Um, I love it. I remember my dad um, signing me up for my first cigar club. Um, he saw that I liked smoking cigars with him. It was a bonding moment. 
And, and my mom was like, why are you signing him up for something unhealthy? Obviously, they're not good for you, right? And he goes, he's going to get to be exposed to such a different group of people. I don't want him around these people. I don't want him to go to a local bar and hang out with those people. I want him to be around the people Very that smart. have... I didn't think about it at the time. I didn't ask him why he helped me sign up for this cigar bar, but, you know, it's $700 a year, you know? Like, that's I didn't have that money. I lived in an apartment. But I got exposed to all these people. A guy owns one of the biggest rental companies uh, in, in, in the world for line workers and electrical stuff, guys that have built, you know, uh, $100 million manufacturing facilities, uh, you know, doctors, lawyers, people that sold cell phones, people that um, were in sales for big stuff, small stuff, all those people were there and I got to go pick their brains and hang out with them, play cards with them, share drinks, share cigars, um, realtors and mortgage people and all that. And it really exposed me to a whole bunch of different people. And, and they did a really good job of that. Uh, my mom did a lot with, I don't know if this is similar to like anybody else, but like we would have a lady that would come clean the house. Uh, maybe you probably have that now. Yeah. You have five kids and stuff. People are so weird about that. Like, you know, you don't clean your own house. My mom would make us clean the house before the cleaning lady came. That's what my wife does to okay. my kids. Okay, dude, I thought I was the only person because I really Wait. didn't know anybody. My mom would the make more me- cleaning lady comes clean. Yes, dude. I was like, why are we cleaning <laughs> when the clean? Now I get it. Now I get it, you know. But, but you have to. You well, have first to. of all, you have to make it easier for them. It's exactly. Like, there's a lot of things. There's but. a lot of that that goes into it. But I didn't have anyone to share that with. I didn't know that that was. And I was like, mom, why are we cleaning? We pay this lady to do the you clothes, the dishes, the clean the floors and the toilets and all that stuff. No, she would have us sweep and mop and, and do all these things before the clean. There'd always be stuff for the clean lady to do, of course. but it would be that much more picked up. So I got that eventually. And that's how we talked about how clean the floors are. And we, and we talk about how immaculate the machines are, the forklifts or any of the trucks and things like that. It's like, because if you have respect for your stuff, the people that are around, you're going to have respect for your stuff. And that was a, Thing that she instilled in me you know she would do those crazy things like if i'd be on the getting ready to get on the school bus and she walked upstairs and my bed wasn't made she would make me come back inside miss the school bus to make my bed those kind of things of like you don't skip the small stuff mm -hmm. and i think that as on the whole it seemed retarded at that time to do that kind of stuff no one's coming over no one's coming over no one's gonna see my room I'm just gonna get into bed as soon as I get home. But it's little things. That but it's you, how you do anything is how you do everything. Correct. And I, that kind of stuff in the moment didn't sink in. Now, being older and not really more wiser, but knowing that kind of stuff, I'm like, oh, okay. Like we can do some of the <laughs> stuff ourselves that might not seem important, but that will teach us to be, you know, better people and and to take care of things and and really respect stuff. Let's switch to your business. Okay. Uh, what's your official title here? Oh, owner, I guess. I don't know. Like, like, what do you do? What do your employees titles. know you for? Like, what what role in the company do you play? Like, what's the, how many hats do you wear in your business? It's different from day to day, right? So, like marketing, accounting. Yeah. So if everything's operation. running great, I'm a nothing. I'm not even a factor in my business at all. Like I'm in like just runs by itself. You know, honestly, we get in the middle of the year and everybody's humming and there's stuff for everybody to do and there's everyone knows where they should be at any given time. We have the processes, everything's run smooth, well-oiled machine. I really don't have a job. When we lose somebody, someone gets sick, someone breaks a leg, someone you know, uh, God forbid, you know, something happens in the family, they have to take months off. I'll slide in there. I'm now I'm canvas manager. Now I'm sales manager. Now I'm a roofer. Now I'm a window installer. Now I'm a gutter guy. Now I'm, you know, whatever. I don't want to do payroll anymore. That was the worst thing I've done. That's so much Excel work. I'm not good at that. I pay my, even when Sierra, my office manager was sick, I would pay her to be like, just look at the things. I know you're in the hospital bed. Just look at it one time before you, you know, so I, I really, whatever, you know, but I mean, when it's running great. I don't have a job title. I walk around, um, I'm more known for the ideas at this point, and then I have facilitating qualities that let me empower other people to make my dreams and my ideas come to fruition. Longest employee that still works for you? I have lots of them. So I started the company with um, 
probably six or so people and one, two, three, four, five of those people are still here. Oh. You know? How many years now? It's about seven years. And uh, Is it hard for you to let people go? So hard. It's so hard. What do you do if, uh, if you see it's not working out or? I try to make it an easy out for them. I try to give them that, hey man, I'll pay you. Take a week off, go apply for some stuff. Like this obviously isn't what you want to do. Um, I will try to do everything in my power to find other places in the company. What's good about having 75 employees is that there's 75 positions. Maybe Dimitri's not cut out to be operations manager. Maybe he needs to be in the sales. You know, maybe... Um, you just move them from one place You move to them, you know. Um, so a 70, lot of that time... 75 employees is a lot of employees. Is it hard to find people now? Or harder? Uh, harder to find great people, right? Um, the special ones. The stuff, the people that... The superstars. The superstars, right? The, the people that you can count on. The people that you don't have to micromanage. The people that are set it and forget it sort of people. Um, it's hard to find those people nowadays. I feel like it was a lot easier in the beginning to find in the early days of people because they wanted to believe in the dream. They're like, this idiot just started a company. We should go work for that. Everyone's making money. And then I got like these random people that would show up outside of my group and and they'd be studs, absolutely studs. And so um, throughout all that time, and then also when you get older and you get older employees, I think it's harder, and I don't know if this is true or not for your stuff, but they have families, right? When we're all 18 to 25, everyone's down to do whatever all the time. Mm -hmm. Those employees that you had in the beginning, they kind of stay on and kind of still know the process. But like if now you're hiring 27 to 35 year olds to 40 year old people, they're not going to work long hours. They're not going to come in on the weekends. They're not going to do all that stuff. So it's hard to find those those people or try to convince 18 year old people that they need to have big responsibilities and go after it. Um, it's hard to find the studs. I don't think it's hard to find people. There's bodies everywhere. Um, but I don't know if that is, we put a lot of time into developing people now more than the raw talent that you would just naturally get. Does that make sense? Um, I love how focused you are. One product, you know, you, you, you say no a lot. I teach in roofing school, my roofers, to say no because I have so many contractors who wants to do it all. And mm -hmm. for me, like if you want to see someone who's going to file bankruptcy or who'll never make it, it's a big magnet on a car. They list everything they do. Everything. Carpentry, they drywall, everything. painting. They and everything. I tell everyone, it's from your insecurities. You don't believe that you're going to be busy doing one thing, that now you want to do everything. Sure. But how did you learn that lesson? Why do you say no so much? Why is it one product? Because I know you have demand for multiple like in the roofing like even in metal even in your niche you have multiple uh panels that you can install multiple colors why one product how did you learn it and where did you get it okay so i asked you a similar question on my podcast earlier when we talked about comparing products and that kind of stuff when you have something and you're going to build your company off of a certain thing like metal roofing like i'm a metal roofer like that's all we do yeah, we do some windows. Yeah, we do some gutters. But that is 5% of the entire business. Metal roofing is 95%. Mm -hmm. Now, are you going to be known to be the best metal roofer, the best roofer, the best standing seam roofer, the best mm -hmm. exposed fashion roofer, the best standing seam roof, or not the standing seam, but like the stamped? Oh, there's so many different things. The riches and the niches. You know, so you go, okay, what do people want? Because you got to take that in consideration. You just can't do whatever you want. What are the people in the mood for? And then what's the best version of that? And you just eventually just narrow it down. I have the best underlay. I have the best ice and water. I have the best profile, in my opinion, you can possibly get for the best price. I have the most efficient way to put it on. I have the most way to ensure that my warranties last forever. I have everything figured out to a T that I can with confidence put my people in houses and tell them this is how you sell because this is what we do and this is all we do. If you want someone who's a jack of all trades and maybe master of not so many, that's an option. We do this. Hmm. Um, we pass up on a lot of jobs and it's very tempting to go do that. When someone's gonna offer you same money to do a barn panel on top of a residential home, 
sorry, if I put one on your house and I put like a shiny thin gauged panel on top of your house in a nice area, people are going to call me and they're going to be like, can you do that on mine? I'm like, no, we actually don't do that. You know, like I don't want to be known for that. I want my panel to look different from everybody else's panel. I want my screws to look different. I want my the thing to be uniform throughout that. And I want to have a certain level of expectation from my customer that when they order and they look at the 2000 roofs that we've done, that it's going to look exactly like that. Hmm. Not, it was kind of rough in the beginning and then it got better. <laughs> and then now the quality's dropped down. It's the same from day one to now. It's the exact same. Um, how we, how we fasten the stuff, how we design the roofs, the certain, you know, we're, we're sitting in the uh, inventory room. We don't make anything else for anybody else or do anything because we only have the machine set up to set up our certain profile, our ridges, our rakes. And I have them designed because they're the best way to design them for our roofing system, not universally. I could make stuff that works for everyone's roofing system. No, they just work the best for my roofing system. And it's so less confusing when they go into a house and they don't know what to sell the customer. It's like, this is what we do. Yeah, if you want windows, yeah, I do vinyl and I do composite windows. You know, th that kind of separates it. And then you want gutters, gutters are the same. Sorry, gutters are the same. You want five or six inch. We do only do six inch, why? Because it's the best for the metal roofing. Like I could sell five inch to a bunch of asphalt people and separately, but we only sell gutters that are six inches. We only sell two types of gutter guards. You want a helmet or do you want an inlay? Doing That's less it. is doing more. Exactly. And then like, it's just stocking it. The whole thing is way easier and it's just not let me down at all. Not a, so good. Is there any secret, like that sounds to me like a secret to success in any other s secrets that you would call secrets to your success. So what else did you do different that were en enabled you to grow as fast as you did and in this market. I don't know if it were for everybody, um, especially in things that have low margins. Um, but any money that I had coming in, any big money coming in at any time, when you're, when you're left at the end of the year and you have um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, left over, after you've already bought new trucks, after you've already invested in maintaining the machines and doing all that stuff, spend it on the people. We've talked about it and the car rides that we've been on and stuff. If you have someone that would benefit from, I've put roofs on people's houses, I've bought them cars, I've bought them houses. The best people, the people that are gonna make you money, the people that are deserving of it, things like that, the people that bleed your company colors, do anything, even if it seems crazy. Like buying a person a house, that seems crazy. Guess what? They're cheap houses out there. If they're making you good money and they're gonna be a lifetime employee, buy them a house, buy them a car, set them up, set their kids up. I paid for kids to go to private school before that you know, the parents didn't have that money allocated and then all of a sudden they have $10,000 in a, in a school fund so they can, that the amount of buy-in and the amount of stress that you take off of an employee when you do that is insane. It's really crazy, like, and it helps me. Like, you know, and even the top people, like the managers, there's no different from the managers to the employees in the fact that they don't plan for certain stuff. They don't know maybe how to budget their money. They might have stuff come up, you know, you want to just be overly generous whenever you can be because everyone knows the business owners that take all the things and they buy their fancy cars, they buy their big house, they buy the lake house, they buy their second house, then they get in a condo in Florida and they do all that kind of stuff. Everybody knows those people. Those people are not rare. The people that are rare is that they'll go, when I lived, into a tr when I lived in a trailer inside the factory, I bought one of the canvassers a house to live in because hmm. he had some issues with, uh, with his background checks. He had some issues with credit and he couldn't get anything and he was living in the ghetto, paying week to week you know, and the house was getting broken into and he had a young son and a girlfriend in there and he couldn't work efficiently because he was worried about all this stuff. He couldn't get an apartment, he couldn't get a rental house, nothing. And he would look at me, he's like, what are you doing? You live in a trailer and you're buying me a house. And I was like, dude, it's gonna work out. I promise you it's gonna work out. Like, don't worry about it, you know? So that's been my success story. Um, and I think that's why people, relied on me to be their rock in this, to be their friend, to be part of their families. I get invited. I just became a godfather to one of my sales guys 
um, kids, um, all that stuff just because I'm there for my, my people in a way that is uncommon, very uncommon. Where is it coming from? Is it from how you were raised? Um, like, where's the drive? Like, why you do what you do? Why, why care so much about employees? Is it a is it a business strategy, or is it your character and your traits that you have? I think it's a bit of both, honestly. Like, I think you're only doing this uh, so that your family and you are successful. I'm only doing this so my family and me are successful. In the fact that I get to take care of people, that's what I find to be fun. I like to take people on vacations. I like to go celebrate with people. I like to make their lives better. When I when I find out that my employees have bought a new house or put their kids through college or do something, I feel a certain that gets me like that's what I get off on. Like that's makes me happy. Um, I don't get a lot of my stuff from buying jet skis and fast cars. And I don't that won't I can't replicate that. And other people can, right? You know, you can buy an old muscle car and that'll give you some amount of happiness. But the where I get the most is like someone going from a $35,000 a year job where they're doing something that's, they're not a part of a team, they're not a part of a family and they're not growing. And then coming over here and making six figures and becoming a part of, you know, uh, a huge machine that is, they feel like they're definitely making waves and they're becoming an integral part of a, of a whole operation um, and then changing their lives. Mm -hmm. Like if I want to find the people that live in apartments and then put them in houses, I want people part, uh, driving 98 Hondas and put them in brand new F-150s. Like that is cool for me. I don't know why it's so cool, but like, don't you want everyone to do better? I want my competitors to do better. When I would interview my competitors uh, and I would have them on my podcast and then when they'd say like, we're doing slow or whatever, I'm like, that sucks, bro. I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want that to be the case. Like they got families too. Like it sucks. And there's so many companies that are so profit driven that it doesn't leave a lot for that extra weird stuff, like buying cars and houses. And those are the big stuff, but you can do stuff in small ways, show up to their baptism, show up to, um, when they graduate high school for their kids, show up to their family gatherings or whatever, go eat a meal with someone at their house. Like we talked about that before, like that's such a huge part. Yeah. No one wants to do that on the weekends all the time. Like go to, you know, employees houses and eat ribs or, you know, go out in the hot sun and, you know, have, you know, go to their pool parties that they're putting on. But it means a lot to them that their owner would show up and hang out with them and share meals and, and really enjoy themselves wherever they are. I, I like that. Love it. How many hours on average would you say you work per day, per week? So I'm at the factory at 6 a.m. most every day. And I don't leave until it's dark most of the time. Um, because there's a couple hours in the morning where not everyone's here and I get a lot done. I know you know what I'm talking most about. Of the best hours. Oh my God. You're that is just so productive. Nobody's oh my God. When you get in that flow state and you don't get ding, 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 ding. And then at night you have whatever happened during the day that doesn't have to wait till tomorrow. When everyone else is going to bed and they're feeding their kids and they're doing that kind of stuff, I can catch up and be ahead for the next day. But is it, is it sustainable? How long can you? Oh, people ask me that all the time. <laughs> I don't know. It's probably why I'm so hard on my body. Why I'm 300 goddamn pounds and uh, do this. I don't know. Like, uh, I don't have a successful relationships. I don't have. Uh, Does it bother you that you don't? Uh, no. <laughs> like, it's weird, right? So, yeah, I want it at the time that, you know, I would like to wish I was married. I, I wish I had. You're married to your business. You, you have to be, I think. But, you know. When you're alone and you want to be on vacation with uh, your wife and you want to be able to take your kid somewhere and all three of you go somewhere or whatever and you have a big family and yeah, I want that, you know, for sure. Um, but it just seems like eventually I'll get it, you know, it just seems like, but I'm not putting the time in like that's not where I'm putting my time and, and that has suffered. That's why I've been divorced. That's why, you know, I'm uh, I had a kid with someone and don't have uh, not with them and, you know, things like that because 
when duty calls, I show up, you know, when if, if it'd be no different than if I treat this as like if I was uh, in the army or something like that, you get those calls, you got to go out, you're gone for six months. Like there's no, well, we have a birthday party this weekend for my mom. Like, are you going to be there? No. Like I have to go on a job site. I have to go travel. I got this thing. You know, I, I have to go to someone's house. I have to go collect a check. I have to go give a service thing. I got someone's flooding their house because there's a roofing problem or something like, that I just choose that. Uh, maybe that's not a good thing. Uh, I don't want that for everybody. Share the RV story. Why mm. did you have an RV here? Mm. Why did you leave? So I got divorced. My uh, my ex ran off with a sales guy, and uh, which happy for them. They have kids and they're they're good now. So, uh, <laughs> um, but I, I didn't have a house. I'd bought my dream house. I had been like a couple years in business. I was just buying this factory at the time and just signed up for a million dollar uh, loan for to buy this place. And uh, I didn't have a place to live. I lived um, in the guy who owned the cigar bar uh, downtown. I lived in his garage uh, for six weeks or so. And at the end of like six weeks, I go, I talk to my buddy Jimmy and I go, Jimmy, I got to find a place to live. Like, it's cool. Like, I'm this close to work and I got all the cigars I want and yada, yada, yada. But I need to like get a place. And I get, you know, I'm old. Like I felt old. I was like, I don't want to buy an apartment. I'm a man. Like I don't want to do that. And uh, I didn't want to also buy to be tied down to a house. That's another commitment. My last commitment didn't work out. So I didn't want to commit to a house. I didn't buy furniture and all the other. So Jimmy goes, let's buy a trailer. And I was like, all right, dude, let's go look. And we went to Grand Rapids. Went up there and bought a nice trailer. I mean, seventy five thousand dollars. I mean, RV it's, industry. it's sweet. Okay. And, uh, and there was not the gym here. Um, and I just parked it in here. No machines, no racking, none of that stuff was here at, at the time. And I just lived in the factory. By, no employees were here. Nothing was here yet because I had just bought it. Yeah. Like I bought it. And then like a week later after I closed on it, I moved the trailer in here and started living in here. And it was fine. I had no bills. How long did you live in? A year and a half. Year and a half. Year and a half. Trailer. Yeah. Wow. Year and a half. And it was awesome. $225. $225 a month is all I spent on. I still only paid two hundred twenty. I still have it out back right now. Um, just in case. Sometimes I take naps in there on long days. Um, it's It was cool. Um, I think that the canvas manager, I remember him, he would be interviewing people, right, to be canvassers and stuff and door knockers. And he'd walk them around the factory. We had this nice factory. It's clean, it's floors, and we got all these machines. And he, they'd be like, what is this trailer? Go, That's where the owner lives. I'm like, the owner lives in the trailer inside the factory? He goes, yeah. Who do you want to work for? Do you want to you know, work for a guy that is not eat and sleep and everything at work? You know, where, where, where do you want to be at? And who's that committed? And it was a funny joke. Like, even when I moved out, he'd be like, tell people you still live in the trailer. And I was like, I'm not telling people I still live in the trailer. So. Wow, that's yeah, it uh, was weird bringing people over here. You know, you like have friends or you meet girls or something and you had to bring them into the trailer inside of a manufacturing facility. It didn't, who is this maniac? No, who is this serial killer that's going to like <laughs> abduct me? So, yeah, it was, I had to get out of it eventually. And eventually I did. And it was a good. But $225 a month for such a nice trailer is a steal. Like, Dude, it was crazy before COVID. Yeah. It was nuts. That 2.1% financing. And they, I was just, I put $15,000 down and I'll never pay it off. I'll just keep paying $225 a month forever. And, you know, eventually, whatever. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, share the kidney story. Mm. One of my favorite ones. So my best friend is Jimmy. I've talked about him before. Uh, he sold cell phones um, and then I got him co-opted to be uh, my canvas manager, I brought him on, he took a pay cut to come work for me. And uh, he became my canvas manager, people person. He has that light about him that not a lot of people have, where it's kind of like warm and people want to be closer to him for no real reason. He's not the funniest dude. He's not the most handsome dude. He's not the most you know charismatic. He's not the, like the most, you know, he's like, but he just has this energy, no matter what crowd he was in, rich, poor, hard, you know what? He just would attract people and people wanted to be near him. and. Thought it'd be a great a tribute to, you know, you know, having a canvas manager like that. So he came to be with me. Um, and then after like six months of being here, um, 
he started to get sick, like real sick. And um, big old fat Mexican guy. And he getting pale, like Dimitri color. Um, and uh, and uh, he was brown before and he just got white and he kept being sick all the time. And eventually it got so bad, I, uh, I, I picked his son up to go take his son. I'm like a parent to his two, three, three now, three kids. But I had his son. I was going to go take his son shopping for um, his birthday. I was going to go buy him when hoverboards just came out. I was going to buy him a hoverboard. And I drove him to the hospital and picked up his son because um, he was getting a checkup done. And he was when I got back at the end of the night, he was on uh, machines. They were they were cleaning his blood. Everything found out that. He had like 1% kidney function or something crazy. Basically, his kidneys had never developed since he was eight years old. Whatever size they were at his eight-year-old self, they never got any bigger. And so they never cleaned his blood. Kidneys clean your blood. And uh, so they had to cut him open. They had to put these things in him that would, that would be ports to clean out his blood. He had to go do dialysis three times a week. He lost 100 pounds. He was just a shell of the person That's he was. That's a nice side effect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not intentional at all. <laughs> and uh, and so I just remember him during this during this part, he couldn't do a bunch of stuff, you know? Um, and I got to support him through all this stuff when he was sick. He basically got to take a year off work and I got to pay him like he was still there. So his family didn't have to worry and didn't struggle and all that stuff. And you know, uh, I think that was a cool thing that company, I didn't get to do that unless it was for the company. The company did that for him. And uh, so while he was going through all these medical procedures and doing all this stuff, I got to be there for him. Well, after he got a pretty good clip on dialysis and cleaned out his blood three times a week, a lady came in one day and uh, went in an interview and asked him like, hey, like what's wrong with, did you just give blood? You have these tape bandages and stuff yeah. on your arm. He goes, no, that's the port where they clean up my blood. They hook me to the machine for three hours a day and it cleans my blood out. She goes, yeah, so my dad had that. My dad had kidney problems and he had to be on a dialysis machine. She goes, I'll give you a kidney. And he's like, okay, During whatever. During a job interview. During a job interview. And, uh, and she's like, well, where do you go get tested? He's like, don't worry about it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't give her the job, like doesn't say that, like, hey, you're hired, blah, blah, blah. She goes on her own free will to the hospital, gets tested, 98% match. That's crazy. White chick from Fort Wayne. We have a Mexican from Michigan, 98% match. And she goes through with it and gives him a kidney. Wow. She works for us for a couple of years and everything like that. And uh, she saved my buddy's life. Um, and the company did that, not me, not whatever, right place, right time, right. Everything. You can't That's make so that cool. up. That's the coolest. Story. You cannot make that up. He would have never met that person, been in that position at that time, had it not been for the company and, and how life should be happening. Like you ever think that you're not in the right place at the right time. If you have that feeling, you should go and do something else because when you get moments like that, you know exactly where you should be. Mm. And, you know, now he's super healthy, um, besides being fat. Um, he's super healthy. He was, he's, he had another kid after that, and it was just beautiful. And I think that that has been one of the coolest moments that an employee gave one of the managers a kidney, and he's still doing great today. And uh, I'm just really thankful that one, I got to take care of him through his time of need. And two, that he was in a position that led him to get in a kidney, which was just a magical thing. Wow. What, what are you the most proud of, mm. like in your business career here? I don't know. I have daddy issues. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think that my proudest moments come when my dad recognizes stuff. Hmm um so is your dad proud of what you accomplished yeah so yeah he like he he wasn't for a long time right when i was working in restaurants and doing that kind of stuff that was low rent you know you know working with people that smoke cigarettes and do all that kind of stuff and you know and going out and drinking and you know all that stuff he's i had two duis um and and the, i didn't have a lot of proud moments when i was younger and 
He never talked about me to his friends and his higher up people that he hangs around with because he's been successful for many years at this point. And then now for the last five years or so, it's been cool to see that um, evolution of him talking about me in those circles where he's like, did you hear what my son's been doing? Did you hear blah, blah, blah? Did you hear, you know, that he did this and, you know, he's doing this and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he can take care of these people and he just did this and, you know, blah, blah. And that sounds good. And it feels so good for someone that has those kind of issues that need to please someone, you know, mm -hmm. what it is. Like a lot of people have daddy issues or mommy issues or whatever. I definitely feel like some part of me is some, like I'll never be good enough for my dad because like he accomplished so much and he was so successful and all that stuff. Uh, but when he talks about being proud of me, that's a really cool thing that I get to be like, can't take that away from me. Like that's a, that's a real moment in time that, you know, propels me to go on and try to do a little bit better. And, I think that's where a lot of my success probably stems from is not settling because I never made him, I'll never be, I'm Isn't always it? one more thing to make him prouder. Like he'd be a lot prouder if I had another second, you know, facility or if I had five offices or if I blah, 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 if I grew the family, my family and have a bunch of kids. And so like, there's stuff to like go hit. There's never enough when you make it to a certain point. So like you could have stopped. The bar is pretty. Yeah, you could have stopped, right? You could have stopped at any point. You could have stopped when you had 10,000 subscribers, right? But that something about needing more, doing more for whatever reason drove you to do more and more. And I think that's like stems from trying to make dad proud and not thinking that this is just good enough for right now. Like I'm doing better than 90% of the people that I know. Mm -hmm. um, but needing to make dad proud that like, like when I got to buy him four wheelers for his property in Georgia, or I get to like pay for a hunting trip for him and his friends to go on and I get to show up to and I get to organize that kind of stuff. Like, that's pretty cool. Like, I know that you are similar to me in that thing. Like when you got to put on events for people, especially your close family members, like, you know, your parents and whoever is like, that's my son who's doing all that. And I'm like, that is like number one to me. Like, that's really cool. What about that circle? What about um, the darkest moment, the darkest time? Like since you started Ooh, this God, I feel like he did his research a little <laughs> bit. All right, darkest moment. Let's go. There's only, there's only one, right? Um, the darkest moment in, in the with the business and in the life stuff is uh, when I bought the factory in that time, okay? So you have to imagine, put yourself in my shoes for a minute. I'm signing as a 30-something year old, young 30 year old, I'm signing myself up for at least a million on the building and a million on the machines, knowing that I've never had a car payment before. Okay. Two million dollar in loans. I've never had a car big payment gamble, before. Big. I've never had a car payment. Hmm. Okay. I've never financed a motorcycle or a boat. I've never had anything besides a mortgage or Did an you apartment. have to co-sign? Who gave you two million dollars? Did you the bank? Co -sign? They saw my thing and they were like, Yeah, we'll do that really? for sure. Yeah, they're like, You're doing great. <laughs> like and he's on my podcast. He, the vice president of that bank, is on my podcast. Got it. Um, he was a big part of why I'm here today and doing that kind of stuff. But yeah, so I'm I'm already nervous about doing that. I have no bit. We're already doing well, just not doing manufacturing. Just normal. We sell it. We sub it out. We do all that stuff. Go along with our business. Let's. Why are we inst Why do we need to install stuff ourselves or do manufacturing? I just thought I'd, there'd be bigger stuff coming along. So. I'm nervous. At that time, I had a business partner, okay? I wasn't doing it by myself. I had someone to rely on, someone to pick up the slack, do all that stuff. Um, he was going through some stuff at that time. He no longer wanted to be a business partner. He got scared of the loans. He got scared of the commitment. He got scared. He's still my sales manager. He's the most awesome dude. I rely on him to this day, but he couldn't be doing this part of life with me in that aspect. He will never leave me, I'll never leave him. He's the greatest dude in the whole world. But he just mentally was like, dude, I don't wanna do this, I want out. Well, we were successful, so I had to come up with some money, you know, to, to do that. At that time is also when I got kicked out of my house for getting divorced. So like my, my wife at the time kicked me out of the house. So I'm living in a garage and dissolving half of my company to be able to try to pay, um, to, you know, pay, find money, right? You know, I didn't really have any money. There's money coming in, but there's, I didn't really have any, like, big money. And I'm just, every night in a garage by myself, I'm losing my business partner. 
I'm losing my friend who ran off with my wife and I'm losing my wife. It was nuts. It was my, one of my best friends that ran off with my wife, my wife and my business partner. I was losing three of my best friends all in one thing, all in like a nine week period. It was, and I was all alone. I had nothing. I had nothing. I lived in a garage. My parents live in Jacksonville. I don't have any family here in Indiana, nothing. So I was just by myself. My friend is dying from kidney failure. Like, dude, I am screwed. That's brutal. It was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. But on the other side, now, as you well know, being, you know, the sole entrepreneur and stuff like that, you get to make moves faster with less input. I didn't have any distractions because I didn't have a partner to do stuff with. I had a lot of hate in my heart that I had to work through and I had a lot of motivation to do well now because it's all on me. I'm not stop. I can't stop any of this machine. That's the best feeling in the world. Oh my goodness, bro. You talk about finding that motivation for CrossFit and to do these competitions and stuff. I, the only kind of thing I can say is that when I lived in this trailer and I came out of that trailer every day, I was leaving it all out on the, on the factory floor. I didn't have people making the metal. I didn't have people doing all the stuff and doing payroll and doing all that. I, I was doing everything a hundred percent by myself, but I had all the motivation because I had all that hate in my heart, you know, and that when you like almost going into a big fight where you just have to like, you really have to dig deep. And, uh, and I had to expel that energy every day, or I would do something like maybe drink again, or maybe do all that stuff. I didn't do all that. I just worked and that propelled me way out there in front of everybody. I was making my own products. We got huge. We attracted way more business. We became a niche where we're making it and selling it and installing it all ourselves. I got to handle all the problems because I lived here, worked here, did everything and it worked out. But it was, that moment was, was real, it was real, bro. I would call you self-made just for coming out of that dark hole. That was weird. Not many people would do that. Last question on the business side. Um, Talk to me about your practice of buying people's junk, people's yeah. assets. Yeah, one of my favorite things to do on the opposite side of like when you treat your employees and you kind of over uh, indulge on whatever they need and like be in their form and that kind of stuff. You also work with the customers the same way. I have the same exact practice to where there's some stuff in the way of making a deal a lot of times. Like if you are um, trying to do something, especially in a sales thing, we're trying to sell you a roof. We want to make the roof work for you. We want it to be affordable and we want it to be the best thing for you. And sometimes stuff's in the way. Maybe you have a giant motorcycle payment. Maybe you have a giant car payment. Maybe you have a golf cart that you need to sell. Maybe you need to sell a boat. Maybe you need to do whatever. Um, I will take that stuff in lieu of money. Hmm. So if they, have uh, I bought in a shuttle bus that I turned into an ice cream truck. I bought in boats. I bought in cars and motorcycles. What's the coolest thing to do? I have a 70, 1970, no, if anyone's watching this and wants a barn find, <laughs> I have a 1970 Nova SS. It's not the prettiest, but it runs. And it has a giant 454 in it and stuff. It's cool, um, but I don't know what to do with it. So. <laughs> Um, I have a really, it's a really cool muscle car. Um, that's been the coolest thing that I've got. But lawnmowers, the lawnmower that you see right over there, people were like, hey, it's a $15,000 lawnmower, whatever the fuck it was. You know, they're like, I really want to get this roof, but I just, you know, made a bad deal and I made, I purchased this and my wife hates it, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, cool, give me, now maybe the roof was 17,000 bucks. Well, give me that mower. And I will and give me 2000 bucks and we'll do the $17,000 roof or something like that. Wow. Yeah. And that's been kind of a fun thing to acquire all these different things, <laughs> you know, all over time. And what do you do with this stuff? Do you sell it usually? Do you give it oh, away? Man, we, we haven't sold anything yet. I wish I could sell everything. <laughs> I'm usually give it away. I usually just give it Why away. Why don't you sell some care? I'm not good at that. Like I'm not, you put it on Facebook marketplace. You got to talk to all these weirdos, the tire kickers and stuff like that. I don't want to do it. It's or I find uses for a lot of this stuff I, and uh, pickup trucks and shuttle buses. And the car is the one thing that I need to sell. Um, but because you can't really give it to somebody because it's like not useful thing. Yeah, we're, we're going to we're going to help you sell it. Guys, comment below if you're interested or just Fort Wayne, Indiana. Come and get it here. Yeah, I will put a link to the pictures and the video 
and the sound that this car makes. And then one of it, it's cheap, like 15,000 bucks and I'll drive it to you. I'll put it on a trailer. I just want to get rid of it. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. Um, I have an electric pickup truck that we got in a thing. And one of the deals, like one of those that Whistling Diesel had, like the little small ones that go 20 miles an hour. It's like a big golf cart. You know, I just don't know what I'm going to do with all that crap, you know, but it's fun and we make it work for the customers. Well, so you gave away a car. How was that experience? A very expensive car. How much was the car? $180,000 supercar. Uh, what was the car? It's a Ford GT replica. So you did it for marketing. Did yes. it pay off? No. <laughs> no. Would you recommend anyone give away cars? Not at all. Don't do that. Like uh, What went wrong? Uh, okay, a couple things. One, um, if you don't have a really good plan, then plan to fail, right? Uh, so that was one. I thought that in general, it would take off like, you know, you have a good idea and then you have a basis for your plan and then eventually you just figure out how to do it. Um, I don't think that I quite had the marketing down to how I was going to get that car out. I know that's when I first started talking to you and reaching out and go, hey, you're like, do some burnouts and do some like cool stuff with the car. And I'm like, shit, I'm about to give it away. I should have probably done that. Um, but really, I just took this car to all these shows, the home and garden shows, the flower and patio shows, the <laughs> blueberry festivals, whatever the people I can put a car to. And I would have the iPads there to people to sign up and give this car away. I was hoping that it would drive demos and sales that people would sign up for the car, hoping to win the car. They would also get a roof and blah, blah, blah. People would get roofs. A person would get a car, do a cool story, brand awareness, all that stuff. What happened was, is that people were so hesitant to sign up because it seemed like a scam. It was too grandioso of a thing to do. Perception was not on your side. Yeah. If I would have given away a $15,000 car, people would have been like, yeah, he's probably giving that piece of shit away. Like, <laughs> no, they didn't. Everyone over 40 was like, no. And that's a lot of our market, right? So not a lot of people signed up. After that, then it was uh, making people were verified in our area that owned a house that would need roofs or windows or gutters off the fascia. So like the system for doing that, but you can't put in a lottery, which is what that was, you can't put those, everyone has to be available to win that. And so like for me, the person that won the car didn't own a house, okay? They didn't own a car. They didn't own anything. They just signed up at a car meet that was there one time. And this lady won the car, like did nothing for my business. You know, it did nothing for whatever. And uh, I probably sold 10 or less deals from that. And uh, I wouldn't consider that excess. I don't, you know, like uh, I would never do it again. Um, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone do it. If you're gonna do it, do it reasonable. All these home shows, people will do like four wheelers or lawnmowers or, I just didn't want to do anything hokey, right? That's where it gave the birth to it. It's like, I didn't want to give away free windows or a free roof or whatever, like that normal stuff. Mm -hmm. Or guess how many jello beans are in this roof or, or in this container, whatever. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be you different. Want to send out, be it yeah, didn't work I out. It. Do the jelly beans, do something else. Don't do <laughs> give away a $180,000 car. It was not a great write off. It was not a great promotional thing. It almost discredited what I was doing because no one believed that I did it. Um, I did give it away. Um, I only sold seven to 10 jobs, but cool, I owned a supercar for a year. Let's talk about immigration in our industry. We have an immigration crisis. We have a lot of immigrants coming in. Florida is passing law about you know working there. Uh, what's Midwest looks like? Indiana? Do you have like what's your labor force look like? Who's doing the work? Who's in the roofing industry here? Well, I, I think the people that generally, when you think of roofers in Indiana, they're going to be one or two people, right? They're going to be Amish or they're going to be Mexican illegals or or of Spanish descent. A lot of Guatemalans and things like that. Um, primarily that's the workforce that is on the roof. Um, we actually just have an Amish and he's got some Mexicans and then we have an all white people crew or all American crew or whatever you want to call it. Um, but like they're, it's different, right? So like, I wish that I could hire the immigrants, but due to laws and things like that and payroll and having everyone's W2 that works here. So I can't. W2 them because they don't have social security and you know some of the best people I've seen that are roofers are of Spanish descent uh, or Amish uh, and the Amish people don't want to pay taxes so they don't want to be W2'd 
Oh wow! And, and right, because it's yeah, yeah, yeah. They get paid, and then and then the Mexicans they just can't, you know, legally legally do it. Um, it's a if they would change stuff that me to allow them to work and pay taxes, they would, you know, they would pay taxes, but they can't because then they'll get found out and everything. So it's that's a real. I would be able to have ten crews right now if I could hire all of the people because what happens is is there's this vacuum where since the Amish people don't have to pay taxes and they just write paper checks and do all this other stuff, they'll hire all the illegals to do it, the labor and uh, they'll just run the crew. So there's one Amish guy and eight to 10 Mexicans or Spanish people and that's the whole gamut. So like they're cheaper, they work mm-hmm. faster, harder, they're more skilled, uh, they work the weekends, they don't stop. Uh, Hard to work with? like compete against them yeah well i mean as far as scaling for sure like uh taking people um of non that heritage or that that style and trying to make them hey you want to go up it's going to be 100 degrees on the roof and you're going to work 12 hour days and it's you're not going to make a hundred thousand dollars a year like are you in what is earning potential of a roofer um install it like someone who installs metal roof and he's very good Oh, it's tough, right? So is he a ground guy? Is he a, is he a custom dude? Can like he, skilled. Skilled. Is he skilled. I mean, you could you could potentially, if you're not going to run a crew and just be on the crew, you should be probably looking to that fifty to $75,000 um, for being a, a regular run-of-the-mill hand. You know, that's where you should you should try to be at. Um, and then if you run a crew, you should be at six feet. If you're good enough to that, you know everything, you can do anything on the roof, and you could take anybody and go do a whole roof project. Man, you know, you should be making six figures. That's not bad. I mean, compared to other jobs, I mean, people at the banks, you know, make like 50k a year. They work in the air conditioning. They work eight to five. They don't have to show up early or stay late. Yeah. That's why that exists, and that's not for everybody. My dudes work super hard, and they're super good. The benefit of having uh, all, let's say, English-speaking crew is that they can communicate to the customer effectively. I found that when before I had install crews that worked just for Perfect Steel Solutions, in-house people. When I was in the first couple years of business, I hired all you know subcontractors, all Spanish or Amish people. They couldn't communicate to the customer. There was a lot of language barrier stuff that would happen. Amish people don't have language. They do. They really? really do because they don't get exposed to anything else besides Amish culture. I see. So English is there, so but communication skills are not. Let's just throw this out here. I'll, I'll give sure. I'll give away this stuff. Uh, whatever they go to the bathroom out in the out, outside. Number two, number one, they don't care, right? They don't they don't care. There's nothing weird about it to them. That's what they do. They don't go all the way inside to go do that. They'll pee in a neighborhood in a golf course. They'll take a crap in the woods. They they'll do whatever. They don't. Is have, it a thing? Is it like it's common literally complaint? happened? I've had to give away thousands of dollars before to make it up to a customer because um, they found a box in a field full of poop that a uh, Amish per- person has left. Um, the people will go outside, even when the customer was like, "Hey, you can come inside." And use the bat. They they they'll do that. They refuse. Ring cameras uh, when they first came out. Uh, I got to find out a lot about my, what my crews were doing because they would catch them on the ring cameras going potty in the yard or something like that. Like, it, <laughs> That's it would, embarrassing. It's so embarrassing because you don't think that thing was happening. I didn't have a meeting beforehand. Go, hey, guys, don't pee in my yard. Don't pee in the yards of the customers. <laughs> you know, like that's a weird thing. That's I don't I didn't think of having that conversation with them. The All Mexicans right. is the same way, um, whether it would be uh, they would go into people's uh, garages or use their microwaves or plug into their power when they shouldn't do or borrow the rakes and tools. I've had, you know, Mexican crews before that, you know, everything is kind of family style and they have gone into people's garages and got drinks out of their fridge, like waters or whatever, and, and, and use their brooms or rakes when they forgot theirs. And I lost thousands and thousands of dollars paying people going, I'm so sorry they broke your grandmother's rake. Like, apparently it was a very nice rake, and it was bad. So, like, there's an advantage that they are super efficient and they're super hardworking and stuff like that, but there's disadvantages to hiring those crews as well. So that we found out that um, having in-house crews, training them up and putting them out there, the communication and the expectations get followed through more consistently and our customers can expect a certain level of quality 
but it is very hard to scale. You can go on any of your groups that we're both a part of, yep. and there's how many people going, hey, looking for installers, we'll pay this much a square in Northwest Ohio, Southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, I've got 15 jobs in Florida I need. You can't scale, and that's why these crews come in, subcontract, and they travel, and they go do all this stuff. Do you think it's because um, salespeople and installers paid not fairly and disproportionately? Like sales reps makes six figures, and crew, you know, someone in the crew makes 50K, and there's just not enough money to motivate them? Is that Ooh. the problem? Are they underpaid? And do you see it's – because here's what I noticed. Uh, in Minneapolis, after the hailstorm, you will see uh, rates are raising up super crazy because now we start bidding for them. It's a supply and demand. So I remember 2017 storm, you know, big companies coming in, they're desperate for labor. They don't bring their labors with them. So they compete for local crews. And the guy who yesterday were charging $90 a square and now charging 140 and he does not care about 10 year history with your company that you help him through all the years so now next one five companies offering him 140 it's a bidding war 100 percent. but is it because they were underpaid before and now it's leveling playing field finally crews start getting paid where they're supposed to be paid it's or an interesting it's an interesting question i've never been put like that before i have been of the mind that canvassers people that go door to door and installers should make as much as the salespeople. Mm -hmm. that's not how it works in real life i don't know why um maybe that it's talent maybe that's how replaceable people are or whatever i th i think uh, i'll interrupt you yeah. really quick i think it's the value to the business the business owners value new business more than taking care of existing business. So anyone who brings you a job, you want to essentially incentivize them. Like, yeah. you know, we'll do anything for the new business. But once you have a business, you nobody wants to overpay. So it's a market price. So sure. whatever this price is, I'll pay. And I'm an entrepreneur. I have to figure out my business. But the challenge is that we glorify sales guys yeah. as a more important people. And I feel like in our industry, we don't do enough for the installer. We don't we, do enough for yeah. labor. Would you agree? Oh, 100%. Um, the top, especially the top guys. You're talking about the skilled, know it dude. Not the guy that is a helper. Not the guy that's chain smoking cigarettes that may not show up every I'm day. Pooping in the yard. Pooping in the yard. <laughs> like the real dudes. The real dudes that you can count on that show up and show out. Um, historically you know it's it's just a it's a weird game um out there for for that there definitely needs to be a metamorphosis that happens on the on the labor side for the roofing i don't know how that is because it's subcontracting and w2 is so different yep it's so different if they find a way to level the playing field to where the cash makes sense for both sides and it's not unfair like subcontractors don't have to you know in my area, they don't pay taxes and stuff. They were use illegals. They, you know, they, they don't have a way to go. I have all, my subs when I had them, like they would come to me, um, the Mexicans and the Spanish people would come to me and be like, we want to work for you. We want to drive in nice trucks. We want to work in blah, blah, blah. And there's just nothing I can do for them. So they get to work for whatever they're going to work for. Now it's more money to be on the roof working for this Amish guy than washing dishes in the back of an Outback Steakhouse. Of course. So it's still, you know? still better. It's still it's still better opportunity, but they they can't. The person that runs the subcontracting crew, those are the people making the money, and that's the that's the non equalizing part. Hmm. If they find a way to make it harder for subcontractors to that exist in that fashion, I understand that not every subcontractor that's an installer wants to be a business owner and and do the whole marketing and sales and all that kind of stuff. But I can't get anybody from a good subcontracting crew to come join me from an immigrant status way because it's so unfair like i can't do anything for them there's i'm not willing to put my business at risk and start a different llc and try to use fake social security numbers and do all that, that happens in our industry um but eventually you get found out and people will get their the, the irs is going to get their dime bro 
You know, if you owe them, and they're going to get their dime. So that's the hard part for me. Like, I think it would equalize a lot if there wasn't such a disparaging way of doing business between subcontracting and in-house crews. I think that you'd have a lot more steadier business as well. But because of those big companies, they come in. We've all seen it. We don't get hail a lot over here. We just had a hailstorm probably four or five years ago. And companies I've never heard of coming from all over from... California, from Florida, all these people, and they'll go sell three, 500 jobs, and they'll bid out the work to whoever to do it, and they'll come in, all these people leave the W-2 stuff and go work for these crews and get paid crazy amount of money, and then after that, they're gone, they're out of a job, and they gotta go back to these other places. There's no way to, there's no way to equalize that stuff. You know, if they can make, make it so that way, you have to be licensed, insured, um, and you have to be not 1099 in that fashion to, or I don't know how to fix it. Yeah. I don't know how to fix it. How do we get people in trades? So like, let's say someone is legal born here. Yeah. How do we attract those people to our industry? I think that as installers, not as a salesperson, sure. sales jobs and office jobs are easy. I'm talking sure. about getting someone off their phone and say, go install the roof, become a roofer. Most of the things that I get are the people that have tried a different trade already. I don't know how to get them into the trade per se, unless it's like, I've taken a lot of people from other parts of the business and been like, hey, I know you can't do on the feast and famine commission side, you know, as being a canvasser or a salesperson or whatever, you need to try window installation, you need to try gutter installation, you need to try roofing installation sure. and switch them to that. A lot of times they get burnt out because they're like, I don't want to climb 20 foot in the air and work in those weird conditions and, and work that much. And a lot of times they, they, they figure out how to do it and they get really good at it and they want to do that. But um, to get people in the trades from like high school and stuff, it's going to have to be sexy. It's going to, something's going to have to switch where this AI or something that's going to take a lot of jobs away from people that have cushiony jobs. Like, I have it here in, in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana to where, you know, I can pay a gutter guy 18, 20 bucks an hour to go be a regular gutter guy and work normal hours and stuff. Or you could go stock shelves at Walmart for $23 an hour. Like, how am I supposed to compete with that? You know, where's the bottom of, of the thing? Where am I supposed to get people that will do easy manual labor stuff, you know, when you can go stock shelves at Walmart and just do brain dead stuff all day. And I'm trying to teach them how to do gutters and do all this other stuff. It's it's sure. super hard. It needs to be, whatever those jobs are in the low level stuff needs to take that away so that they have to go and do other stuff. Well, I agree, 100% agree. It's, um, we need to raise, I, I personally feel like we need to raise wages. And a lot of craftsmen do get a lot of money, especially once you start running your own show. Like I know a lot of carpet guys, a lot of, floor guys who makes a killing you can make 500 bucks a day if yeah. you're good with your hands if you're hanging gutters but again it's you working for yourself but if right. they work for someone else that's hourly it's 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 harder so the the trades have to get paid more because we cannot compete you're right like if medium wage at mcdonald's is 18 bucks and construction company pays you 25 people go list resistant path yeah it's way easier and way more not scary you can yeah. do the low level jobs at walmart mcdonald's and there's nothing wrong with that it's just anyone can do that like are, I, are we, unions be here you know i have one story about that that was weird go ahead um do you know what a union salt is no okay me either when i uh last year i hired a guy he worked for me an entire year good dude he was in uh the he was a sheet metal worker or a union, like they did sides of commercial buildings or something way high up in the air on these giant 50 foot lifts. And he said he just got tired of working there. He came to work for me and uh, he did a good job, honestly. It was really strange and he was like awesome. And, and then one day he just, uh, he just quit. Like in the middle of the day, he just walked out and everyone started talking to me after that, he uh, had all these pamphlets all around the offices for the unions. Like you need to come to the union, what you would get paid and blah, blah, blah. And like the benefits, he would put them on the back of the urinals, the back of the toilets and the offices and the front door and the windows and all this other stuff when he walked out. 
And then during this time here, he went to every single employee that he thought that would make a good metal worker or whatever and told them that, hey, I'm, I'm actually this person and you need to come to this union thing, blah, blah. And they would try to steal employees. What the heck? Yeah, dude, and it's called a union salt. Have you ever heard of it? Union comes, what? A salt, like salt and pepper. Now, oh, this, union salt. This comes from. That's what I thought. I this heard. comes from salting the mines. Have you ever heard that? Like you got to salt the mine. Back in the day, if you were gonna sell a mine or sell sell like for mining gold or or diamonds yeah. or whatever, the owners of that mine would go down there and toss some gold and some diamonds and some stuff in there to salt the mine. So that way, when people go down, like they would go down and find gold and they would find diamonds. Be like, this is a good mine. I see. So they would do, now the union has people that they pay to work at other companies to steal people. Wow. And it's completely legal. It's genius. It's crazy. It's genius. Because the reason this exists is because unions have to constantly be recruiting. Because you gotta pay the people that are, that are timing out and going into retirement and they get paid the retirement for the next 30 years because you worked in the thing. If they, if they quit at 60, you're gonna get paid till you're 90, 100 years old. Yeah. But that money has to come from the union. So they gotta have people paying into the union coming in to pay the people coming out. So they have to constantly, they're like really the aggressive. Government. It's exactly social security. It's exactly yeah. social security. If I don't start, if I don't keep paying my social security, when my dad retires, he won't have, that'll run out by the yeah. time that I get there and blah, blah, blah. And then more people will have to go. It was crazy. I've never thought I would have to experience this. I talked to my dad and he knew something about it. And that's how I found out about all this wow. other stuff. I ended up calling the guy and he was, I was very calm. I was very mad, but I was very calm. And I was like, what? And he explained what he was doing. He was like. So he, you confronted him and he. Yeah. I, and he got paid $20 an hour or whatever for me. And he got paid $20 an hour from the union to work here and steal employees. What? For a whole year, not like a month. Did he steal any? No. So he could be socketed. at it. So he gets paid like 20, 40 bucks an hour. Correct. For a year, not like a month. F for a year. Didn't accomplish anything. Came to the Christmas parties. We went out to eat. We did all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Was a normal employee with absolutely zero red flags. Union is such a waste. The simple it's fact weird. that this program exists just proves how waste, how much waste there is. They were very necessary back in the day. If you do your research, they were yeah, very, yes. very necessary back in the day. Right now, but, I would make an argument that they but are. But you have metal shops here who is. Yeah, we have unions? union. You have union pipe fitters. We have union metal stuff. We have union stuff. No you metal. No, no roofers or anything like that here. Um, that's more East Coast stuff. When you get into there, they yeah. have union roofers, union tradesmen, all that other stuff. Um, I only know that because when I was in the barge business, hiring people to go do. Uh, they had a crane, like a union crane operator, union forklift drivers, union carpenters, union ground guys, union, they had union everything. So That's insane. it's not that crazy here, union but there's, salt. yeah, union salt. They, they pay someone to come to your business to get hired in. Genius. And to steal. <laughs> yeah, if you can afford it. Yeah, 100%. Can, 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 can we do it to each other? Can you Correct. install someone to like bigger? I could pay. Or, or if you worked for me, Dimitri, I could send you be like, hey, I'll pay you 80 grand a year. And you go work for XYZ Roofing Company. You it's get on a crew. Thing. You do a good job. You prove that you're the, a good dude over there. And you steal as many roofers at the end of that <laughs> year. And then, But that's also how he moves up in the union. So, oh. like, he has to go do his union salt stuff. It's like being the low guy in the army. It's like a missionary work at church. Correct. <laughs> like, if you want to be an alderman in the church, you have to do your missionary in Guam or wherever you're going to go, like, to get up to the, be an alder. Like, you had to be a union salt to make it to the second level of the union, union or salt. whatever. It's wild, bro. It is wild. Wow. Let's talk about solar. Uh, what's your experience with the solar? Why don't you see solar panels here? Why are you not in solar business? Okay, tried it. <laughs> um, I definitely gave it my best go. I installed a roofing system. I went and got the best panels. I went and got the best batteries. I went and got the best inverters. I, I went and researched all this stuff. We sat through a bunch of stuff. We went and got certified. We went and got GC license for that. We went and found the best electricians and the best installers and yada, yada, yada. We totaled it up. And then the final part of that was the financing stuff. And people don't want you to talk about this, which is the weirdest part. You could do a lot of segments on this part, but the banks do not want you to talk about dealer fees. Okay. I don't know why I'm not big enough to get in trouble, but 
I can get in trouble. You could get in trouble, but like it, it, it's it's weird. There's no way to make it make sense as far as a, a profitability standpoint or a break even thing for solar. I installed this. It was like a normal house. Let's call it 18, 1600 square foot house, ranch, blah, blah, blah. It was 60 some odd thousand dollars, maybe $55,000 worth of product and install and pulling permits and doing all this other crazy stuff with batteries and, and backups and blah, blah, blah. And I'd have to sell this thing for $75,000, $80,000 if it was just going to be a normal markup, right? $10,000 worth of $6,000 of work, be like a normal markup. But when it came down to the financing stuff, all of the solar people, all of them, bar none, I don't care who you are, and you can message me, Perfect Steel, if you want, and would love to talk to you about it. There's 20% bank fees that you have to include on top of your stuff for the banks to put these 15, 20, 25 year, 30 year things for these solar things. So you can finance a solar job for $80,000 and have a $250 a month payment, $300 a month payment. That means I'd have to sell the roof for $90,000 because they're gonna take, or if I sold it for 100K, they're taking 20 grand off the top. The bank's keeping that. Now you're working with $80,000, you know, worth of stuff. And it's just, there's yeah. no way to make $100,000 make sense to a customer when you're talking about a job. I'm using just large numbers because sure. that's easier for me. It took two years to install. Um, the technology's not there. And at the end of the day, we, we did everything that the engineers said to do with certain light facing and what times of day and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't a huge difference on an on electric bill, not even a half. And in Indiana, you're only allowed to be 60% efficient. That's another crazy fact. So you can't be, you know, everyone wants to be off the grid. That's the thing. Don't, you can't do it. That's you, impossible. It's impossible to do it legally. So, all right. That means I'm only going to save you 60% on your electric bill if I made it the most efficient I could possibly make it. So you're still going to have a solar bill and you're still going to have a power bill forever you know there was just no benefit for me unless i just really wanted to grease customers and just be like the a luxury brand for solar it was too complicated the technology it will be there i think it will it will come around it, everything's getting smaller and more efficient it will happen remember how big computers used to be now you know your watch does everything that the big computers used to do so yeah. It will come around and it'll be affordable and it will be for everybody. It's not that right now. If you're looking at five years ago, um, the panels and how efficient they were to what now, they're garbage. Five years ago panels to today's panels, they're absolutely garbage five years ago. And in another five years, these panels would be garbage because it's changing so quickly. If you're buying solar and you have net metering and you pay cash, there is a possible chance that it will work out for you in a positive thing. But if you're financing and you don't have net metering, there is no way, and I'll talk to anybody about this, there's no way to make it make sense. That's why they killed it in California. Like net metering cancel, that's it. Killed yeah. the industry. You're done. Well, net metering, for people who don't know, is like a one-to-one -one buyout. Yeah. So if you overproduced anything, then you got paid another credit, which would help you if you were 60% efficient, and the times that even you were more efficient than that, the grid would buy back that power, making up the other 20 to why, 30, Why 40%. do you think they're canceling it? The, okay, don't, don't they so I know. Do, I, I know, so I, I contacted Nipsco, Heartland, RMC, the, the big companies around here, the Duke Energy, all these places, and I go, why would they do that? Why are you hiring lobbyists to go to Congress to kill net metering statewide, federally, all that? Why are you doing that? And they said that a lot of the reason comes from future planning of electricity and, and, and power installs. So when you design a city, let's say like Fort Wayne, it expands so much and expands outward in different places. Businesses go up, factories go up, everything like that. They have to plan to ship and store and make all that power make sense for all that stuff. It's not just singly, let's put a power station in the middle of Fort Wayne and it'll distribute power to everybody. Some sides of the city might need more power. There might be more neighborhoods going in in a certain place. When people start cutting back on that use uh, in those places, it, it messes up the future planning. If people start to go off the grid, now you have all this infrastructure being built out for all these future things, but people are getting solar and screwing that all up. They won't need so much power and they won't use so much power. It'll be dollars not spent well for them and there'll be less money coming in 
from the people in those neighborhoods, area, counties, and cities. Mm -hmm. So that's why they said the main reason they're killing net metering off. Also their profits. Also their profits. If you're giving money back to the consumer, you're not keeping that money for yourself. That's just pure and simple. Uh, but when I, I asked the higher ups, that's what, what they said. Political answer. Uh, let's talk about financing roofs versus like, you cover that dealer's fees, financing solar does not make sense. Where are you on financing metal jobs? Um, what are the trends? Do you see like, is it similar to car financing where like um, we finance as a society a lot of cars in the yeah. United States. Uh, roofs historically, you know, very small percentage, but for you it's higher percentage, but is rates going up? How much does it cost to finance a roof? What are the trends? Do you finance more or less roofs now than you used to? How does that work? In It'll that always be a predominantly financed deal for us. like. I would say 80% of our jobs are financed um, with, because not everyone has 30 grand, 20 grand to save up. Because you're on a higher ticket. For sure. Sorry. You know, yeah. when you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, you might be able to come up with seven to 10 grand for shingles or something like that. But when you get to that 20 grand mark, you're starting to narrow down. Your, Just like buying a car. Your, yeah, 100%. Exactly. We all buy beaters. I've, I've done it before. Yeah. Take a thousand bucks, you leave with a car. Hmm. Um, the cool thing about this industry, there's so many banks to choose from that do third party lending and, and stuff that just do home improvement lending that we get to make the banks fight. So there's good rates, there's good terms and there's good all that stuff. There are bad ones for sure, but they're really consumer focused people. They come up with decent plans from time to time, especially in the busy times where you can get 0% for a certain amount of time. The dealer fees are almost a thing of the past except for when they have really bad credit and we eat that at the end so like we don't know what your credit score is when we walk into your house we don't know so a lot of times um it'll be from five to ten percent you know and that'll just eat the profits but there might be five percent of profits left in there on that one or it might go really good job or something like that um so we'll eat that but there's really not a lot of dealer fees for the stuff that we do in a regular plan ranging from if you have just really good credit you can be looking at anywhere from five to six percent if you have really bad credit you can look 13 14 percent like those when it gets kind of thing like sketchy but a lot of our people that do financing they will do like uh like a 24 months deal where they'll take their money out of their 401ks or get a heloc or something like that but they won't take the tax burden the whole year on on all that money and they'll pay it off next year so they just need that that gap in between there and it doesn't cost them any more money got it canvassing why you rely on canvassing versus digital and any other form of advertising canvassing has the only thing that's ever been proven that works for me without having to bother people like in a different way like yeah people knocking on your door is definitely going to bother you it's definitely some people um you can have a call center which is super profitable and super annoying like the amount of bad publicity you get from having a call room where they're just dialing for dollars and like going through a phone book and calling strangers trying to set up appointments um i did i know that when i first started this i knew i wasn't going to do that then i fell into what we you you started your channel about in the back is like these lead generation companies i would say that and you can agree disagree with me i would say that 95 percent of all lead generation people are scam artists mm -hmm. Maybe that's not true, but in my opinion, that's only been true. I signed up for all these things, Home Advisors, Angie's List, uh, um, all, all these things, and I paid $100, $130 a lead, you know, that they would send me, these people need seven to 10 windows, these people need, you know, roofs, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh shit, this is so easy. You just pay them the money and they give you the business. They lure you in at first with really good leads and really solid stuff. And then eventually they just make up crap and they just stick you with stuff and they keep charging you. I spent probably, probably a hundred, hundred and twenty thousand dollars in the first couple of years of my business paying those people to do that stuff. And with less and less returns as every month went on. And then you get to be an elite partner and they charge you $5,000 a month, but you only get the elite ones and they give you so much time to contact them before anybody else gets them or you, you only get it. If you pay me more money, another five grand a month, no one in your area will get these leads, only you. And like, we're like, whoa, I mean, yeah, I could probably, 
all crap, all lies. <laughs> um, every day, including sitting here with you, I got in two Facebook messages that say, could you lose another, could you use another five to 10, 15 leads a month free with no charge? Well, I'm like, just scams. It's more annoying than uh, warranty people. For our industry, 100%. I don't get near as many car maintenance, insurance warranty things on my phone as I do people. Could you use another five to 15 leads a week? You know? Um, so canvassing is just a real steady way to take, the, take that money that you'd pay this big corporation and put it in the hands of people that will do good by you, that will target the right houses, target the right neighborhoods, and they'll be able to make a living for themselves. Yeah. Of course, I'm going to spend millions of dollars a year on having 20, 30 employees or whatever like that, pay them to go out there, the gas, all that stuff, commissions. But, or I could give a million dollars a year to Angelus Home Advisor, these lead pro people, blah, 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 all these different, that doesn't help anybody in my community, you know, it might help me if it works, I don't believe in it, but you know, like, it doesn't happen. So uh, canvassing was a way that I could predict the outcome almost every single week based on the numbers that I have in canvassing. So I got oh. to build a business off of that. Those people grow, they only get better. You got someone in the first year of business and they're doing, they're putting on two or three leads a week for you, you know, which is probably good for one sale. They're only next year when they get better and they get more comfortable, they're gonna put two sales on the board for you a week and they're gonna set seven to 10 demos. and. And that's been easy to scale. Hard business because it's, it's, that's tough to go door to door and start a new conversation with strangers, uh, but very profitable and very consistent. Name a few mistakes that the roofers make. Ooh. Um, I would say, well, we're speaking in generalities here, because yeah. um, I'm friends with a lot of the local roofers that are here. I would say, number one, they, they get too many people involved. If, if you can do it with less people, do it with less people. Drugs and alcohol are a problem in our industry. I don't know why, maybe it's stressful, I don't know. Um, but drugs and alcohol, um, a problem. Uh, people not constantly reinvesting even when they have good years, they take too much. And they don't have enough for when it gets dry at the beginning of the year or they need to go buy a whole bunch of product you talk a lot about Robert and Peter to pay Paul, uh, one of your famous sayings. Uh, that happens almost every single company I've ever talked to ever is that they need to wait on these three jobs to get done to be able to take the profits or that money to buy more materials. Like we've never been in that rat race before. Like we keep all the money in there so that way we can do 80 jobs this week. We can do one job this week. We can pay 80 employees or we can pay 30 employees. It doesn't matter how good or bad a week is, uh, we're not relying on that money. So financing or having a big line of credit that they use either with manufacturers or whatever, um, that's a huge problem. Um, and then falling into the, if you're not watching like a channel like this and exposing yourself to the fallacies and some of the places that are doing bad stuff, if you don't know that certain lead generation people are bad, if you don't know that certain gurus are bad, if you don't know if certain uh, materials are bad or manufacturers are bad and then you're going to spend money on stuff that you don't a need or things that won't work at all i remember i hired um this scam artist uh from roof engine which i'm sure you've heard of them before mm -hmm. i mean this dude fleeced me for hundreds of thousands of dollars promised me building like these microsites and they would do all this stuff and they would i would get all these leads and i never got anything and they disappeared to uh what's the place that Far away island somewhere, you know, like ba Bali, where's it called? Bali. 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 Yeah. Like, you just go on, out of my life. Wow. Like, if you don't expose yourself to people, people have talked about it before. I just didn't know about that. So, fake guru. I have a competitor here in town that he hired a guru. We talk about um, you being a guru or Rodney Webb being a guru about all these people being gurus. They're good gurus out there for sure. There's also bad ones. He hired one of those people that do the scan test. Are you a, a type, you know, CL person? Are you an owl? Are you a lion? Are you a blah, blah? And if you don't fit that criteria, they hire and fire based upon those things. He fired 60% of his workforce because they didn't fit within the confines of this social structure um, test that they all had to take. It destroyed his business where he was the only salesperson. 
he had one office lady and a production manager at the end of it. And he was doing the last year, he was doing $5 million a year and he had 30 employees. It was just, you can get a lot of bad info and then hope that that's going to propel you and do better stuff for you. And at the end, it really just drains your bank account. Underlayments. Would you, you, you install high quality underlayments under metal roof. Would you agree that as far as roofing products evolution, the underlayments is the biggest improvement that we have over the last few decades. Yeah. And that's the only thing that really truly uh, keeps the roof dry. But my question to you is if you have solid underlayment, let's say someone who installs asphalt shingles install same quality of underlayment as you do, but essentially, would you agree that that's what really keeps the roof clean and dry? Yeah. But yours is metal and yeah. they're asphalt. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, so it's, why invest in metal if if asphalt will keep yeah. underlayment? Well, let's talk about it in the, in the thing of protecting, you know, um, you drive uh, probably a nice car. You've ever heard of like the clear bras that you can put on there? or like the yeah, ceramic yeah. stuff that you can put on there. The reason you do that is that to protect the paint. you protect the paint. You're on the car and, and, you're, and you're rolling down the road and you get a rock chip and stuff like that. Then you have to, you're going to the base layer, then it's getting to the rust point and then it fails, you know? Yeah. Or you can keep it nice with another product. What you're trying to do is protect the thing that's valuable and the thing that's doing something, that, 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 that job. With shingles, it's, does, it's protecting that underlay and stuff like that. With metal, it's just better, you know? Um, you don't have to worry about hail. You don't have to worry about wind. You don't have to worry about uh, stress factors from heat and cold and, and all these different things that uh, these elements that, that, that prey on, 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 on roofing systems. Um, if you can keep that under laminate, if you can keep that protected and not rely on that solely, that's going to do you all the wonders in the world. And whatever that best thing is, you know, there's people in Florida that use cement on their roofs, right? I mean, literally cement or clay tiles or whatever. You're just protecting that that barrier to not let anything get through. So that's what I figure what metal roofing is, is just a really good way to protect that system from going through. You can't ice and water your entire house, right? Because then it won't breathe and you'll rot and the and the humidity will be all screwed I mean, up. You can in certain scenarios. If it's, can uh, you? Yeah, if it's a vaulted ceiling, for example. So when you don't, like, let's, like if you have a spray foam so, so not every roof is the same. If you have attic, yeah, you need a breathable. But if it's, um, let's say, like in Florida, they have a lot of houses with a vaulted ceiling. So it's you have drywall here, you have sprayed insulation in between, and then you have no attic here. Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't so there's a, there's a lot of scenarios where you absolutely can. Or if it's a low slope, like if you have 312 or 212, you're supposed yeah. to do the entire thing. It's just there's a lot yeah. of areas of the house where you can go all yeah. in. If it wasn't a situation of rotting and, and, and humidity problems, I would ice and water the whole house and never have to worry about yep. it again, you know. But it's it's how it's built, like yeah. the, the whole nine years, the whole scenario. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, underlay is really, really, really important. Um, the less holes that you can have in it, the less, uh, the, the more, the better you can apply it in the certain ways, um, you know, the way you overlap it, how much stuff you give to the valleys and the, the overshoot of the water and things like all that stuff matters. I just feel like asphalt manufacturers figured it out because once we start having these better materials, synthetics, ice and waters and stuff, their quality of shingles start going down. They start getting lighter because oh, they don't yeah. have to be as good because underlayment does all the job. All you have to do is protect it. And I think that's where 50 year warranty start. The 50 year warranty in the asphalt shingle world did not come from better shingles. Yeah. They literally jumped from 30 year to 50 year. I think one to compete with metal because metal has a 50 year warranty. Correct. How do we compete with that? Yeah. Well, let's just write better warranty. And two, underlayments became better and that asphalt shingle will keep the underlayment protected. If you think about it, there's nothing going to happen to the roof as far as leaks goes. If nothing going to happen to the underlayment. Yeah. So like with ours is 180 day UV guarantee on mm -hmm. our, on our underlay. I'm sure it's probably good for, yep, yep. for yours as well. Um, so, but the problem is, is like if you had shingles and the wind came up and they blew off the shingles, then you're sure. exposing that to the sunlight It'll eventually dry and crack. And then you have those problems. And so 
if you can keep that thing coded, if you can keep that thing protected, yeah, that's going to be the newest technology um, that you need to rely on. If you're if your roofing salesperson or roofing expert is not talking about how good their underlay is, that's an issue. Because there's cheap ones. We twenty five dollars, exactly. And there's I pay in the upwards almost two hundred dollars. I mean, they're expensive. And there's another problem with it too. And I've I've made videos about it. If you're the homeowner watching, listen to this. If you have insurance claim, so let's say you install metal roof, right? So you you have spent two hundred dollars per, you know underlay whatever like premium price now it's insurance claim insurance uh storm chaser comes in bids in a job i will work with the insurance company yeah. now you know that many many roofers will bid in a job right and they will not even specify in writing what underlaying is oh, they yeah. use we install uh, some water so now you have you you're supposed to replace the previous like in quality so the same yeah. as before right so now you have your highest quality underlayment, but there you have Storm Chaser replacing your roof and then not putting in writing what yeah. ice and, so now he's doing basic ice and water, basic felt, and but he he's removing $200 roll with a $60 roll. Happens all the time. Very and, important to be in be And in homeowner needs to, and I, I advise homeowners, ask your roofer to put in writing accessories. For sure. Because, and especially if he's getting paid to put a premium quality and he's using basic or builder's grade. I like this. What about when you see uh, an all asphalt roof and they have metal valleys? My biggest thing, I go, why do they put metal valleys in an asphalt roof? Uh, because it's the best. <laughs> why wouldn't you use that on your That's whole a good roof? Selling point for metal oh company. yeah, if I'm in a house and uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm on a homeowner, I'm like, look, Look what's in your valleys right now. <laughs> Why would they use this over your entire roof, this asphalt product? And in the most spot that leaks critical. happen, critical part, they use metal. And they're like, because it won't leak. I'm like, so why wouldn't you just do metal over your entire roof? Yeah, I get it. So, like, it matters what your regular asphalt stuff or just, you know, you know how they layer it and stuff, which I think is cool that how they layer uh, yeah. asphalt and, and the things. I don't, I don't know how to do that, but... Yeah, that's an important part. Like, if they list out all what they're going to use, be like, I want metal valleys. I want the highest grade ice and water, the highest grade underlay. Um, when they're when those insurance people are going to replace it, that'd be super big. Absolutely. Last question. You've known me for the past forty eight hours. Sure. Hours Give me business advice. Based business on what advice. You know. What a sucker question that you ask. <laughs> business advice for you. Well, I think I just keep consistent with the advice that I told you before. Is that you know, you have this whole, you know, cooperation, not confrontation or something along yeah, those yeah. lines. Collaboration I don't over confrontation. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, you're doing a really good job of being the good guy um, in this industry and being a voice for the people that are not up to speed all the way or that in this industry that are looking for actual advice to do good things with their business and families and, and coworkers and stuff. Just, if you're going to be confrontational when it comes down to sticking up for stuff just make sure you always come back to being that that good guy and that that uh champion of the of the right way to do stuff so yeah you're gonna have to be confrontational when people are doing bad when they're stealing money from old people price gouging when they're bait and switching when people are doing uh giving bad advice uh, people that are bankrupting these companies people are taking advantage of subcontractors people are whatever yeah, you're going to have to call those people out, but do a really good job of going back to what you normally do and this guy go, all okay, right, so that happens. Let me teach you how to do it the right way or what I've seen work for a bunch of people, give examples and be like, this is the way it would be great if if everyone did it this way. I think that that's the coolest part about you is you're not looking for that those news stories, that scary Fox thing where like stay on at six o'clock to see what's might be killing your children. You know, like you're not doing that. You're doing like, Hey, there's some bad stuff over here, but we're gonna I'm gonna show you what's bad and I'm gonna show you how it's gonna be a lot better if you can look for all this stuff. And I, I think that's a really cool thing that you do. Thank you. Out of 100 contractors, let's say in your area, what's the split do you think between good guys and bad guys? How many good, really good God, guys? There's such, are... <laughs> there's such a scale. There's such a scale. The worst people, I think there's 25% that are like the worst. The worst. You gotta watch out. One out of four. One out of four. You get four one. estimates. There's, I would say, one out of four that deserve to be called out. That 
that need more education, maybe. Like, maybe not everyone's bad. They've got taught by bad people and they have, you know, you know, things are yeah. family businesses and they get taught like certain they ways. They've trained that way, yeah. Yeah, dude, there's nothing wrong. They just not, they're ignorant to like other stuff. Hmm. I got a sweet kid that was on my podcast, you know. Um, he has subcontractors. He has one person that works for him. Um, he's buying all of his stuff from, you know, like a Menards when he gets product and stuff. And he charged people $900 a square because people will buy shingles at $900 a square. He's not a bad dude. He's a sweet kid. He's awesome. But he just, well, he worked for a company right before that and they were selling that's stuff. So he just doesn't know. I don't, that's a, to me, that's a bad dude, you know, and the fact of a bad roofer, but they need to be educated and stuff. I would say 25% of some people need to be called out or educated. Let's say that. Well, that's what we do. Thank yeah, you, buddy. That's what you do, baby. <laughs>